Good morning Year 3 and welcome to day number 6 of Homeschool Learning. Today, in your writing lesson, I would like you to write a persuasive advertisement for Madame Couscous's International World of Treats. In your maps, I'd like you to follow the link to the White Rose website and in RE this afternoon, we'll be discussing The Last Supper. Chapter 6 of Hamish and the World Stoppers what Robin said had really made Hamish think. If the world kept stopping, but he didn't, well, imagine all of the amazing things he could do. He was getting extra time after all. If the next pause lasted for the same time as the one earlier, he'd get at least seven minutes and seven seconds of extra time. Hamish felt certain that with enough of these pauses, he could do something really worthwhile. He could invent something perhaps, like a flying car, or a, a hover spoon. Or he could come up with a cure for all known diseases. Or he could work to bring peace to the world. He could do all of those things. Or he could just eat loads of sweets. That would be quite a good short-term plan while he worked out the finer details, Hamish decided. And just to make a head start in that plan, he turned in the direction of the high street. Hamish pushed open the door of Madame Couscous's International World of Treats. The little bell above the door tinkled. The sunlight was streaming through big square windows, but that was not dust dancing in the air. It was sugar. Madame Couscous did not look up when she heard the bell. She was perched behind the counter, reading the Starkly Post and eating cocktail sausages from a mug. <sighs> Hamish loved this place. All of the kids in Starkly did. Madame Couscous stocked the finest sweets and candies from across the globe. The shop was legendary. One of the few places in town you could definitely not call boring. Dad used to bring him here all the time, calling it the secret mission, and buy him whatever he liked. It was the only reason Hamish had needed a filling from Dr Fussbundler. He rubbed his cheek and winced at the thought of that enormous dentist's drill. The way it juddered and shuddered into his poor tooth until he could feel his brain rattling about in his head. But it was worth every second, he decided, if it meant he could still go to Madame Couscous's. Once a year, this unusual old lady would book a round-the-world ticket and set off on a month-long adventure. She'd take trains and planes and buses, bikes and unicycles. She'd climb mountains and swim through rivers. She'd fight bears and squish spiders. All because she was determined to bring the very best treats from around the world to the children of Starkly. In France, she discovered the sweetest, most delicate cheese and bacon flavoured mints sold by a glum old gum farmer high up in the Pyrenees Mountains. She brought that stuff back to Starkley and it sold out within the hour. Delicious! In Italy, she wrestled with the Italian Prime Minister for the last box of Italian candied prawns. He thought he should get them just because he was the Prime Minister. Well, Madame Couscous was not having that. So she grappled him out of the shop, into the narrow streets outside, and down an alleyway, into a gondola, which she then used to row all the way to the airport, with that box of candied prawns under one arm. Delicioso! She sold Mexican chili sherbet. Nam! She sold peanut butter eggs she found high up in a Russian tree. Rakushni. She sold American fried jelly. Delish! And those enormous toffee sausages everyone walks about with in Germany. Schmackhaft. The only thing she didn't sell was Norwegian salted gobstoppers. She simply could not stand those Norwegian tongue girdlers. They offended her so much, in fact, that she had banned all Norwegians from her shop. So, because she wanted the kids of Starkly to have 
almost all of the sweets of the world, you might imagine that Madame Couscous was quite a lovely woman. And she was... until the day she wasn't. She had returned in February from a month-long trip away with absolutely no new sweets. Just a packet of Tic Tacs she brought at the airport. Her cloud of white hair, which had once been so soft and so thick, was now a dark grey. Like each and every hair was suddenly in a bad mood. Her once rosy cheeks seemed to have spread, so that now her whole face was a particularly angry red. And whenever anyone asked her what had happened to make her this way, she would bark at them like a very fierce dog. It was rather odd to see a grown woman barking like a dog. Many people wondered whether she'd been swapped for her own evil twin. That was how bad and mean she'd become. Now, Madame Couscous even kept an old brown stick behind her counter, with which she'd hit children if they took too long to get their change out. It wasn't even their fault they took so long. Their poor little hands were shaking because they knew this fearsome OAP would wrap their knuckles or thwack their backsides with that big long stick like it was nothing at all. Some kids would spend all evening picking splinters out of their bottoms after a visit to Madame Couscous. Which meant that Hamish now approached the counter with caution. Underneath a large white sign that said, Only one and a quarter school children at a time! Madame Couscous looked up at him, bored. Yes? She said. Um, said Hamish, trying to decide what sweet to ask for. What do you mean, um? Said Madame Couscous, slamming her fist down on the desk with such force that an entire bottle of Brazilian banana babies shook on the shelf. What does that big red sign say? Hamish looked up at it. It says no Norwegians, he stuttered. Madame Couscous closed her eyes, furious. Not that big red sign, she yelled. The other one! Hamish read the sign next to it. Well, that one says complete silence? Exactly! She shrieked, pointing one skinny finger at him. And you just spoke! But, 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 but you, asked, you asked me a question, said Hamish desperately. You said yes? So what? She said, bringing her big stick out. You did not have to answer! You could have performed a small mime! A mime? said Hamish. Stop talking! she yelled. I want complete silence! Did I not make that clear? Y yes, said Hamish, but, 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 but you, you keep asking. Will you stop talking? she shouted. I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, said Hamish, confused. I, I, I honestly didn't mean... Right, that's it, said Madame Couscous, one snooty nose in the air. You are banned! Banned, said Hamish. And then he realised he'd said it out loud and quickly covered his mouth with both hands. Banned, she said. The ratty little mudmouth Hamish Ellaby is banned. Banned from Madame Couscous's international world of treats, and so are all of his friends forever. She wrote his name down in a ledger and finished with a flourish. This was awful. This was dreadful. Why was she doing this? No, Polish butter lollies for you, she said with a foul and twisted smile, leaning in close to Hamish's face so he could see it properly. No Afghan aniseed, no Belgian bonbons, no Swedish cinnamons, no Chinese whispers. Hamish started to back out of the shop as Madame Couscous seemed to grow bigger and bigger and get angrier and angrier. Hamish could see that the door to the stockroom was slightly open. There were boxes and boxes of unopened chomps in there. There must have been millions. No Edinburgh eye poppers. She cried, no Fanaraki fizz whizzers, nothing at all for you or your friends.
forever. And then she began to bark. And Hamish turned and ran out of the shop. All Hamish could hear as he sprinted down the road was the cackle of Madame Couscous, gatekeeper of the sweets, and the howl of what sounded like a mad dog in quite some pain. When Hamish got home, he found his mum on the phone, looking very worried. She still had lipstick all over her face from this morning. Oh, poor Scratch and Mole, she said, putting their handset down. Such lovely little girls. Hamish scrunched his nose up. Lots of grown-ups seemed to think Scratch and Mole were very polite and well-spoken. They didn't realise they behaved like completely different children in front of other people's parents. Instead of growling things like, Come here, you winkle-faced ninny hammer! They'd say things like, Oh, Mrs. Ellaby, you do look lovely today. Or, My, what a wonderful morning it is! How lucky we are to be alive! I bet you do that too, you little stink nit. What happened, Mum? asked Hamish. I saw the police at school. She sat him down. Their parents, well, they seem to have disappeared. What, all four of them? said Hamish. At once? Yes, said his mum. It's the strangest thing. Someone thinks they probably went on holiday to Magaluf, and just decided to let the girls look after themselves. Oh, what a terrible, terrible thing. Hamish thought of his own missing dad, and his mum could see it. Oh, Hamish, she said. I know. We... But she didn't know what to say. What could she say? She'd usually just say, We have to just carry on. That's okay, Mum, said Hamish, not wanting to have that conversation. I'm going to go and get changed. Then I said I'd meet up with Robin. Hamish's mum looked at him sadly. Hamish turned away before she tried to talk to him about it again. Have you noticed something weird going on with the grown-ups, said Hamish, sitting on his favourite swing at the park. He changed into his after-school clothes, his white jumper with the big blue H on, his black and white baseball shoes with the silver wings, and his cool black jeans. What do you mean? asked Robin, who had his binoculars out because he thought he'd seen a worm at the other end of the park. Robin was absolutely terrified of worms. That was why he always wore Wellington boots. It just feels like there's something weird going on, said Hamish. Like... How come Madame Couscous is so horrible now? Oh, said Robin, still on the lookout for evil worms. That place is scary. Oh, I don't go in there anymore. Well, that's lucky, said Hamish, because you're banned? I'm what? said Robin, looking at Hamish in shock. You're banned for life. All my friends are, because I spoke out loud. Robin sighed. Whew. Well, that's a relief, really, he said. Last time, it took me a week to get all those splinters out of my bottom from her bashing stick. But, uh, yes, I, uh, I have noticed some grown-ups are a lot grumpier than they used to be. Like who? Like Red Sox at school, he said. He had his leaf blower out the other day. You know how I hate loud noises. Well, when he saw my football, he stuck it right on the end and then blew it way up into the sky. It went up and up for ages, and he just kept laughing. I think my ball's probably on Mars by now. Hamish was shocked. Rex Ox had always been a great caretaker. He used to let the kids steer the school's ride on lawnmower. And the only reason he'd stopped was because Manjit Singh Daliwal had completely lost control one day and ended up carving his own name into the school field by accident. The Starkly Post said there were only two man-made things an astronaut could see from the moon. The Great Wall of China and the name Manjit Singh Daliwal scribbled in ginormous letters on a field in Starkly. But Rexox took the blame for that, 
just like he did when some of the kids tried to make a parachute by sellotaping all the umbrellas from Lost Property together. They didn't realise it would catch the wind before they had the chance to try it. Twelve kids ended up stuck up a lamppost four miles away. It was Rex Ox that got them down and kept the whole thing quiet. He had always been a caretaker who took care of things. Which made Robin's story very confusing. Why on earth would Rex Ox suddenly use his leaf blower for evil? Asked Hamish. Robin shrugged. He said he did it just because he could. Hamish was amazed. But now he thought about it, Robin was right. Rex Ox had been a lot grumpier recently. And then there was Tyrus Quinn. Ever since he'd gone away on a weekend to Bruges, he'd been in a foul mood. Sometimes he'd make the kids do cross-country runs in their pants, even when it wasn't P.E. He'd just stroll into a science lesson and shout, Right, you horrible bunch of abominable oddballs, start running! And then he'd blow a whistle and chase them out of the school and into the woods, waving his stopwatch while they screamed. And then there was Grenville Biles' mum. Oh, Mrs. Bile was the worst. Because she had been grumpy for ages. Well, with everyone except her pampered little darling Grenville. Now, she was like double horrible. Hamish did a very good job of avoiding Grenville Bile and his mum. The woman they called the Postmaster. I heard all the grumpiness is to do with the economy, said Robin. That's what my sister told me. What does that mean? I have absolutely no idea. He replied. Hmm. Well, maybe the economy was something Hamish could sort out in the next pause. Surely, seven minutes and seven seconds would be enough for something like that. Briefly, he thought about telling Robin about what had been happening. It felt like too big a secret to keep to himself. But then again, this was a kid who was scared of worms. And leaf blowers. And sudden noises. And Velcro. Once, Hamish jokingly told him that The Wizard of Oz was based on a true story. And Robin hadn't left the house for a whole week. Hamish couldn't imagine what would happen if he told him the whole world was stopping. Oh, it's a shame about Madame Couscous, said Robin, before Hamish could say anything anyway. I promised my mum I'd buy her some Japanese jellyfish shavings for her birthday. Now I suppose I'll have to go all the way to Japan to get some. Or maybe, thought Hamish, there was another way. All he needed now was for the world to stop. So there we have it, chapter six of Hamish and the World Stoppers. If you have any questions, year three, about today's work or about the book, or if you just want to chit chat, please do contact me on my email address, year three at saintalbanrc.bham.seh.uk. Until tomorrow, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I'll see you soon.